Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us for another of our online talks from Our Universe Revealed. My name is Jonathan Crass, and I'm the series coordinator for this public lecture series from the Department of Physics uh, at the, and the College of Science at the University of Notre Dame. It's great to have you with us this evening. Um, as always, if you want to know more about our upcoming events, uh, do please visit our website, nduniverse.org where you can find, uh, sign up to our mailing list, see the upcoming events, but you can also find out that information on our Facebook group as well. Um, we are going to continue the usual format of talks this evening with a presentation from our speaker, followed by questions. As always, whether you're watching on Zoom or via YouTube, you can submit those questions at any time and we'll collect those yet and then ask them after the presentation. If you're on Zoom and joining us that way, you can submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom app. If you're on YouTube, you can use the chat feature to the right-hand side of the video. And you can also use a, the Google Form option that I'll send a link out in both the Zoom chat and in the YouTube chat shortly. Tonight, we're branching a little bit out from physics to welcome our first speaker to our universe revealed from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Notre Dame. Uh, Professor Olaf Wiest has now been at the university for over 20 years and serves as the director for the Center for Computer Assisted Synthesis, or CCAS is its acronym, it's a little easier to pronounce. His research focuses on understanding how molecules interact and react, and with that information, how we can develop and make other specific, bi specific biostructures or design specific drugs. So tonight he's going to talk about some aspects of that research and how we can use artificial intelligence to help. So, Olaf, are you there? Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be the first chemist to take the plunge onto uh, the physics um, uh, seminar series, which I think is a great idea. So thank you for Jonathan to, for putting this up and uh, you know, putting all the work to organizing, there's quite a bit of, of uh, work involved there. So um, thank you much for that, uh, very much for that. No so, problem. Let's see if we can get your screen sharing working with that sound option. All right, so let's see. If I remember to go all the way back, right? Yeah, yep. I know we need to switch your screens. Okay. Uh, swap. Is that better? Looks good to me. Over to you. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so, welcome to the uh, Rise of the Machines. Um, I was actually quickly looking into the uh, into the attendee list, and there's a couple of people uh, that actually know probably more about machine learning and, and artificial intelligence than I do. Uh, hello, Zoltan. And um, but what I want to do is really how this this whole field of machine learning and artificial intelligence um, has really changed the way science is done these days. I mean, artificial intelligence, if you look at the uh, popular press, is certainly one of the things that has captured people's minds. And, and whenever we have something like this, there's a lot of hype around it. And so what I'd like to do today is really give you a, a layman's view of what is what are really the ideas behind artificial intelligence, what's happening there. Um, try to convince you that this really has been around for quite some time and most likely you have actually done it multiple times. Um, and then maybe try to, to separate a little bit the hope from the hype uh, and see what is really what is doable and what are the shortcomings of it. Because the, the idea of artificial intelligence of intelligent machines is really as old as mankind itself. Um, whether they are these kind of, you know, somewhat bumbling robots that at the end of the day movie still save the day, um, we still project our hopes and fears and in, in, into these, these automatons, whether it's something like this or rather something like that where you know, it's an artificial intelligence that's basically all going to kill mankind, um, typically says more about us as humans than about what is really out there. Um, 
as I said, the, the idea of artificial intelligence really goes back all the way to the Greeks that uh, had things like this, machines that, that could think or non-humans that could think. Um, so, so this is something that has been around for a long time. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is really the focus on artificial intelligence in science. And I really broke it down in two parts. In the first part, I want to talk a little bit about you know, what is really going on there, what are some very simple examples of machine learning, some of the peel, tools people use. And then in the second part, I want to talk about some applications of that in science, namely in that particular uh, area of, of science that I feel most familiar with, namely chemistry. So in the first part, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these more tools that people use, rule-based methods, statistical fitting. Uh, one of the big things uh, in the area is now what's called neural networks. And uh, I'm gonna call, talk about a few applications that I selected really to highlight some of the uh, caveats and pitfalls that uh, come with the use of artificial intelligence. And then in chemistry, I picked out um, three areas. One is drug discovery. Um, which is certainly one of the most difficult, but also most uh, rewarding areas of, of chemistry. Uh, and then I'm gonna put in a shameless plug for the Center for Computer Assisted Synthesis, uh, which um, at Center at Notre Dame and really tries to try these um, machine learning algorithms to accelerate synthesis. And at the end, I'm gonna show you an example of not from our work, but from somebody else, um, the so-called computer. All right, so let's get started. What is artificial intelligence? It's really a, a concept that has been around for a while. So here's a definition from 1955. And uh, it's basically the idea that a machine or a computer or an algorithm can really mimic an intelligent human being, uh, every aspect of it, so precise that you really can't tell the difference. And this is something that is uh, known by the so-called Turing tests. So imagine yourself, you're an examiner behind a wall and on the other side of the wall are um, two entities, either a machine or a human being. And you ask them questions, they answer, you try to figure out whether they're, whether they're the computer or they're the human being. If you can't tell the difference, then Turing said, this is um, an artificial intelligence. You can't tell the difference to a real one. Um, this actually is a very interesting way to, to kind of sidestep this uh, problem of what is intelligence really? What defines it? It really uses this, this, this kind of sidestep in saying, if you can't tell the difference, then it's the same. Um, this is of course also a good place to insert the uh, I think in, in talks like this, there's a you know, mandatory nerd joke. So here's the nerd joke from um, uh, from very co popular comic series in saying, you know, for extra credit in this Turing test, if the computer can convince you that you're a computer, then there's extra credit for it. All right, so this is the big field. So how do we get there? How do we make a computer that can basically mimic uh, an intelligent being. And one of the approaches, not the only one, is something that's called machine learning. And so it's an algorithm that learns, that takes input, and each iteration gets better at it. It uses training data, which is going to be an important term that we're going to come across several times, to make predictions or decisions without actually being explicitly programmed to do so. So this is something that can take data and give you some output. And if you would feed it other data, it would give you another output. Um, and it is never told to do this or that. It is simply deducing this. It learned it from the training data. So, okay, so how does this work? Um, and so as a kind of a general outline of, of a machine learning algorithm is a, it's kind of a flow scheme, if you will, where Imagine you, you have a, some kind of data, whatever that might be, and it is really 
um, typically the data as it is originally is often not useful. You have to bring it in a form that the computer can actually understand and that are relevant for the question that you're trying to answer. And that's gonna be one of the, the big problems in this field because what this data is and how you prepared it um, will basically, once you decided that everything else is, is almost automatic. So um, you have to put a lot of care in thinking about what is the right data, what to look like, um, how is it prepared um, to, for the computer because the computer will find or will respond to that and, and find weaknesses in it and do so in ways that are not predictable. Once you have this, you put this into some kind of a machine learning algorithm. And what this thing is, is really a, a computer program, which in the simplest case, simply takes rules, very strict rules of saying, if this is case one, then do this. If you see that, do that. If the data says that, do something else. So a very simple if then kind of thing. And it would use the model, it um, generates one or more models, takes potentially the best one. And then once it validated it, it shows that it works, then it deploys it and predicts new data. And this is actually another important part where the big difference is this is scalable, okay? When a human makes a decision, if you wanna make twice as many decisions, you need two humans. Here, you basically only have to complete, um, copy the model, and you can do this in, in, at a massive scale. And that is really the reason why machine learning and artificial intelligence became so important in today's world, because it's scalable. Many of the things you don't have to, you need to do them millions of times over and over and over again. And that is really the type of things that AI is, is very good at. And then if things go well, uh, you actually make a lot of money out of it. Um, and that is what Google and Facebook and, and the like really is uh, their business model of deploying these things and monetizing them. But I want to come back to one example for a, for a rule-based machine learning that many of you might have worked with, and that is something like this, okay? Because this is, the text code is really about as rule-based as it gets. It is really, this is how things would work and it's very rigid about this. And so is something like TurboTax that um, mimics, if you will, a, a tax accountant, is that an artificial intelligence? And um, as far as you're front concerned, the answer is probably yes, because what you can do is you take some kind of an information data that needs to be brought in the appropriate form. So that can be your, your tax forms and your salary statement and your mortgage statement, all of these different things. And you feed it into this program, which had been developed to, to um, construct a model to really make predictions on what is now your best tech scenario. And hopefully you can then um, monetize it again and, and you get a better tax return out of all the possible uh, cases that, that the tax code allows. Now, this is a very simple case and, and um, tax code is almost um, a unique example for that one because the real world doesn't quite listen as much to that strict rules. It's, it's more fuzzy, if you will. And so that brings us to the next kind of big area of statistical modeling where you uh, have data and that can be either unsupervised data, which means it's just a pile of something. You don't know what it is. Um, you don't really have any structure to it. Um, and which just gives you an idea that this is probably a more difficult problem. And you throw it at the computer and, and basically say you figure it out. A somewhat better way for the training set is what's called supervised learning. And that is where you um, ordered, organized it, um, tagged it, in, and give the computer a little bit of the hint what to look for. Now, the next step is something that is crucial, and then I'm going to come back to a few times, and that is feature extraction. In other words, it asks the question, what matters here? Okay, if you... Um, 
look at back at a, at a case of a, of a tax accountant, what are the, the things that really matter and things like how much money you made and so on. These features, these uh, properties of your data set, your training set, together with the features are then fed into the machine learning algorithm. And there's quite a few of those. I'm gonna show a small, small sample of this one. But it's basically a computer program that somehow tries to correlate these kind of data with the features that you say, well, this here matters. And what comes out of this are can be quite a few different things. So one typical problem is the grouping of various information. So um, is this a square? Is it an oval? Is it a star or what? To recognize things. And you see probably already the importance of that one where you think about things like, like uh, language recognition, text recognition, when you post a, a letter that uh, some computer is able to, for example, read uh, the uh, zip code that you put on there, even though the person had a really bad handwriting like myself. Or you have a more a predictive model that uh, might be more, more um, quantitative. So it is really tried to come up with a uh, discrete value of, of some number, for example, is this stronger than this? Or is this what is a, the value of something? And so what comes out of this, among other things, is that what used to start out with a big pile of unstructured data is now annotated data that you, um, for example, know where that letter needs to go to. So let me show you an example. For so um, the other day I went onto Zillow and I uh, pulled up some of the uh, house prices of houses in my neighborhood. Um, and so when thinking about what matters here, what determines, if you will, the, the price of a house, then I thought maybe square footage uh, might be one of the things, bigger houses are more, um, are more expensive than, than smaller ones. And so what you can see is that there's some kind of a correlation probably. The biggest house here is the most expensive one, the smaller ones are cheaper. And so now I can think about a statistical correlation for that one, I just showed two of them. And so it can be either linear fitting, which kind of works, but um, the correlation is 0.82, so not so great. Um, it could also be in, shown in red here, a logarithmic function, somewhat bitter, uh, better um, fit. And what is the difference here is that this data point here, which is very different from those down here, is still reasonably well um, uh, reproduced. So this is one of the problems that I pointed out earlier, when what data do you put in there? Because if I would have only these data, I would do a very poor job at predicting this one up here. So finding the right data for what you want to predict is, is really crucial. All right, um, what else? Um, well, I can put in some more data and say, how good is the model that I can, um, that I put, that I developed here. So here's some more plots um, of house prices versus, um, uh, square footage, and what you can see is that the correlation is actually quite poor. You kind of get the general trend, but if you try to price a house with this, um, you're probably not doing so well. And the reason for that is that I actually put in two data sets. Uh, one were houses in Chicago, one was in South Bend. And so what you can see is I color, color coded them now, and right from there, you can see that uh, houses in Chicago uh, are more expensive than South Bend, even though you probably didn't need a machine learning algorithm to tell you that. But more importantly, you can say, oh, you know, these here are a little bit more expensive. So they probably are in Chicago, even if I wouldn't have color coded this, versus those here, which are a little cheaper and therefore probably in South Bend. So I can do what's called a classifier. I can distinguish these things here are similar to each other. And then those things here are similar to each other. And that works very well in some areas and, and not so well in others. So if things are very similar to each other, it's a bit of a problem. 
So kind of a, of a recap for that, um, what are the right features? Is it square footage? Is it obviously the location counts? Where, what is the age of the house? So I just picked one feature here, but it could be many other features that probably I could think about and I don't know which one really matters. What is the right data? Um, do I really need this data point up here or can I do just with those? Um, is gonna be important because as I mentioned already, if I just have these data and I try to uh, predict this data point, I will be terribly off. And then last but not least, what is the right functional form? Is it a linear? Is it a logarithmic or, or any kind of a polynomial, any kind of a weird function that you can uh, think of? What is the right functional form? And so, to get a bit of a handle on, on these problems here, people came up with uh, a different type of algorithm. And these are the so-called neural networks. So what they really tried to address are some of the shortcomings that I just mentioned and say, okay, I don't know what the function looks like. It can be very um, uh, complex, but you neural network, you go figure it out. Um, the number of features can be very, very large. I just showed you um, basically one feature, but imagine if you want to recognize a picture where every pixel on the picture is a feature. It can be you know, red or green or blue or dark or, or light. And so you got thousands and hundreds of thousands of pictures of pixels in each picture. And so doing this kind of a linear aggression that I showed you earlier, a polynomial is just, will basically kill your computer very quickly. Um, I told you about a binary classification problem, but very often they are more than binary. Again, is it a square or is it an oval or is it a star? These are many of the things that we need to, to sort out. And then last but not least, I don't want to rewrite the algorithm every single time. I want to come up with one algorithm that, can, that I can use for many, many different uh, problems. And so neural networks are flexible enough to do precise things. So here's roughly what they look like. You have an input layer, which can be the features, and there can be a lot of them. And then I want to get an output layer, uh, an answer, if you will. So that can be a yes, no. It can be a classification over four different examples. It can be any number of things. And then in between, I have what's called a hidden layer. And so that was really the idea where people were start thinking about neural networks. As the name already says, it kind of comes from brain, um, even though the relationship is kind of remote. And even people back in the 40s were thinking about this of saying, okay, if I can start passing messages uh, to this and to that and to that and all of these different combinations, then it turns out that these models, these neural networks are able to uh, come up with something that is really be able to fix or to fit very complex function. The drawback is to a degree is um, I need a lot more data on this side and I need much more computing power. And that was really the reason why until maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, even though the ideas were out, neural networks were really not by far as possible, uh, po um, powerful as they are today. But many of the machine learning algorithms that, that you see now in use nowadays are based in some form of a variation of neural networks. I wanna point out one big problem, if you will, or one of the things with, with neural networks, and that is they're usually not interpretable, okay? In other words, I can go through all of this and I will make, be able to make a prediction here, but I don't know why, okay? I don't know what happened in these hidden layers what the um, computer, what the program, the neural network decided is relevant and what is not. So it is not really an understanding in the human sense, but it is simply a fitting, okay? And so let me show you 
uh, another example of it. So here is a classifier problem. Um, you have a couple of pictures and uh, the question is basically, is it a cat or a dog? And so you would train the, the neural network or any kind of a machine learning algorithm that you might choose. And you give it a, a what's called a, a structured data set uh, by saying, uh, here's a couple of pictures and yes, that here is a cat and that is another cat and no, this is not a cat, this is a dog and there's another dog. And so I tell the, um, the program what these things are, I don't tell it why, okay? And then the program will hopefully pick out the right features in saying that allows it to decide, well, these here are cats and these here are dogs. And this is actually um, can go wrong. And just want to show you again an example for that one. If you pick the wrong features, for example, if the program decides, well, you got two eyes here and kind of pointy hairs, uh, ears here, then, um, well, these two things are actually the same. Okay, same over here, um, where based on the feature selection, it will actually be able and uh, not be able to distinguish these things simply because it picked the wrong things that it thought would matter. And that is one of the things where this lack of, of understanding of really um, why is it, you know, is this a cat and, and, and this is a dog, um, that will be, uh, can sometimes be very, very wrong. So this is just one way neural networks can go wrong. Um, there's also a very interesting area of what's called ad adversarial attacks. So um, you look at this picture and the human would say, well, okay, so there's a little bit missing here. There's some bit of the body and the, the head is missing, but we probably can agree that this is a panda. And uh, the, artifi the uh, artificial intelligence actually would agree with this at this picture here with something like a 60% confidence would be a panda, okay? At the same time, um, I add a little bit of noise on this and suddenly the network decides with almost absolute certainty, this is a given. And so that's obviously not right. And so, um, so this is basically, we wouldn't even notice a difference, but it fits it in the wrong way and comes to the wrong answer. And there's actually a nice area where people consciously use that, where people say, for example, okay, here's something that uh, if the AI looks at this picture, it says it's a banana, and that's probably right. But then you put something that disturbs the system next to it, like this little sticker here, and it decides it's a toaster. And that's, of course, not quite right. So let me summarize this section a little bit. Um, and maybe if you look at some of these things and after having worked on, on AIs a little bit, I, I agree with the response of uh, Andrew Nick, who is this gentleman in the picture here, that sometimes this thing can go horribly, horribly wrong. At the same time, um, this is something that can be extremely useful. And, and uh, Andrew Nick is one of the really pioneers in this area who summarized it as that machine learning is the new electricity and data is the new oil. This is something that by itself is maybe not so important, but has impact on so many different other areas um, that it is like electricity uh, maybe 150 years back that really changed the world. And what drives this is data. It is, machine learning is not always right, um, but it is really good at making an informed guess looking at large amounts of data and it's very, very fast. Uh, but the problem here is that it, it's basically a correlation method. It has nothing to do with causality. It's not a cat because it has, you know, it, it behaves like a cat, but simply because it looks like other cats. And as a result of that, machine learning can be easily fooled if you have the wrong data or if you have small differences, as I showed you between the dog and the cat pictures. And so um, maybe uh, picking the right data is important. And it brings to my mind a, a different, very important person in this field. And that's um, Richard Feynman who said, garbage in, garbage out. If you feed 
the AI the wrong data, you're going to get garbage out. And so the problem is very often you don't know what is bad data. You um, hope for the best, and but the machine learning will will respond to any kind of a bias that you might be in your data in in a way that often not is foresee it's not foreseeable. And so people are responsible. And there's a wonderful website out there that that pokes a lot of fun at um, at the absolutely hilarious fails of machine learnings. And we can talk about that if you want. But what I want to show you in the second part of the talk are some of the applications, how chemists use this. And so, um, so one of the most difficult problems, as I already said, is drug discovery. It's complex, but it's also one of the most important things. And, um, and one of the reasons it's so complicated is uh, particularly important in these days when you see headlines like this, um, that, you know, we're certainly able to cure Corona and everything else. Okay. And so the problem here is that uh, among many other problems, um, probably public service announcement, no, you shouldn't swallow uh, bleach. But um, the problem is more that just because something kills a Corona virus, say in a, in a test tube, doesn't mean that you it's a cure. Uh, it's rather the start of a very, very long process that needs to look at um, things like safety. And just because it works in humans um, doesn't mean that it, uh, it works in a test tube doesn't mean it works in humans. And one of the many reasons for that is that humans are very, very complicated beings, okay? So if you look at something like this, here's a pill, it needs to get into your stomach, it needs to be absorbed, it needs to go through your liver, it needs to go through your metabolism, it needs to circulate in your blood, get hopefully to the right place and do really what it's supposed to do and what you probably measured in the cell. And the problem is we have no idea about this. We have no understanding what on a physical basis really is going on in here. These are extremely complex processes, but we don't necessarily have to understand them. What I tried to tell you in, in the last like 25 minutes or 30 minutes was we, as long as we can fit it, we might be able to be. And this is actually something that is called quantitative structure activity relationships, which were originally developed by Corey Hunch uh, back in the 60s. So this is quite old, who figured out that if I just look at the right features, then I can make quantitative predictions. And so uh, Professor Hunch's papers were, were notorious of having tables and tables and tables and more tables. And so they were not fun to read and, and probably less fun to write. Um, but when you do a statistical analysis of these, these effects and some of the features that you showed there, you could actually do a fairly good fitting. And so here is a, just one example out of the early days of QSARs where the anesthetic properties of ethers is correspond or correlated with the, log the logarithm of the, the distribution between of that ether between water and a very unpolar uh, alcohol, uh, octanol in particular, but it gives you a really nice fit and so you know, based on, on basically taking a test tube and shaking up um, uh, this compound in a, in a mixture of water and octanol, you would predict what is actually the anesthetic properties, even though, of course, it has absolutely nothing to do with anesthesia, but it correlates with this. And so this has actually been used very widely. I just want to show you one example of a rather complex quantitative structure activity relationship uh, this is a class of anti-HIV drugs, and uh, this is the equation, the model that Professor Hunch built. And so once you have all these data and you have a, a, a training set, in this case of 82 cases, you can train these things very, very quickly. And uh, that is one of the reasons why, of course, that was one of the first things people did once COVID came along. So I just... Um, looked at machine learning and COVID uh, last night in Google Scholar. And even though this is only out for two, three months, um, we already have over 4,000 studies using these type of machine learning uh, methods to really tackle um, 
drug discovery. We have been using that in the Walter Center for drug discovery at Notre Dame for some time now. And so here is uh, a QSAR equation, equation for a class of compound called hydroxamic acids that we looked at a number of years ago, this is like 15 years ago. And um, we correlated various properties with the IC50, uh, this is the IC50 for a class of prostate cancer cells, um, so-called PC3 cells. Um, so how good are these compounds, these hydroxamic acids at killing prostate cancer cells? And so interestingly enough, there's things that come up with that have nothing to do with uh, killing prostate cancer cells, for example, the shape of the molecule, how much surface area it has, and it has an oxygen in these molecules, and what is the negative charge on that one. But it actually works quite well over, you know, something like six orders of magnitude, so fairly wide range. Um, but if you do this, and, and that is, again, what I want to emphasize, you need to validate this data extremely carefully. So your entire arsenal of, of statistical methods needs to be deployed uh, to really say, is this real or is this just a spurious correlate? All right, um, let me finish up by talking a little bit about the Center for Computer Assisted Syn Synthesis. So 15 years forward from the last study, we are now much more progressed in this and we can really try to use these kind of quantitative uh, data-driven approaches to make synthetic chemistry, predict synthetic chemistry, how should we make any kind of a compound? I'm only going to present a very few cases on this one, but if you want to learn more about this, so here's a shameless plug for our website and our Twitter feed where uh, you can learn a lot more about this. So this is a group of six people, um, uh, Nitesh and myself here at Notre Dame and other people at Princeton, Colorado State, Berkeley, Utah, um, that have different sets of expertise. And we work with various companies in pharmaceutical industry, chemical industry, information technology, but also with academic collaborators, but also try to yeah, really give talks like this one here to the broader community and saying, look, here is really a new development in science, what we can do with this. So let me show you what the, the problems that we're trying to solve. And so here is really the problem that any synthetic chemist, uh, and I saw even on the participant list, a few uh, people that were, were participating in here. So these are the problems that the graduate students in chemistry very often have to deal with. And that is, let's say you want to make this compound that I showed you earlier. You have to take a couple of reactants and maybe a few reagents, a catalyst. You need to decide on a reaction temperature, how long, a solvent. And so if you, if you do just a few cases of each of those, um, and but if you try to look at all of the combinations, you get up something like, like 4 million possible combinations. And each reaction takes something like a day. So it's probably pretty clear that this is, you know, is not going to be feasible. Um, even though our graduate students work really hard on it. Um, so here is an example we can use. So here's another reaction uh, that Matt Sigmund in this paper here studied. Uh, and again, you see the various things people tried. In particular, they were interested in looking at this ligand here. So this is one of the ligands that they tried. And again, that generated a training set which really, really small, just six data points. But that was and turned out to be enough that they can fit a polynomial in this case. And even though many data points were possible here, they don't have to do this. The six are enough to really find the optimal ligand that gives uh, really a good result uh, for what they were looking for. Um, here's another example from the Doyle lab uh, that is again a part of the, um, the center. And um, so this is a, a reaction called the buchholz hartwig reaction. And what they're trying to do is make uh, a bond between a nitrogen here and a carbon here. And this is really one of the uh, most widely used um, reactions in pharmaceutical industry because most of the drugs that are out there contain one or more nitrogen. And so again, um, they tested a few things and uh, they actually did a few more data sets. In fact, they did over 4,000 of them by testing various 
additives and reactants and catalysts and bases and all of that. So they did actually close to 4,000 experiments. And then they generated the features and this was actually done computationally. So this is actually fairly fast compared to this, but you generate features and then you train the, mod the model and what it gives you out there is the optimal synthetic procedure for any reaction of this type. So rather than now having you know, try many things, you can actually predict for this particular reaction that you're interested in what those are. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the model will predict really what is a catalyst, the ligand, um, the reaction that you could do. And so they tried a whole number of, of um, machine learning algorithms, and I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but you see our old friend, uh, the neural network here, linear fitting, both of them, the linear fitting, not so good, the neural network much better, but the random forest, which is another um, method here, is, um, is really the best. I want to finish with um, just saying that what you come out of here is procedures, synthetic procedures, um, cookbooks, if you will, that allow you then to, to make molecules. And one, of course, once you have these cookbooks, if you will, then you can also use a robot again to really do this. So here's a picture of an automatic synthesis lab, a robot, if you will. Uh, this one particular one is in a lab at MIT. And I want to finish up with showing you an example for this. And that is a synthesis of Benadryl, um, which is this compound here. It was the first FDA approved antihistamine and it's still on the market uh, today under these, um, under these names here. And so uh, a lab in, in the UK has actually programmed um, a robot uh, or a com computer, if they call it, to make this compound. And I want to finish up with that, um, if it allows me to do so. Well, I think we can only see the slides. Sorry. So you may need to share the other window. Okay. Let me go back to this. Is this better? Um, I'm just not seeing the YouTube video window. That's all. I'm still seeing PowerPoint. Mm. I don't know if you need to share your web browser window instead, perhaps. Yeah. Let me do, 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 do. share this one then. That looks better. Let's get to
Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and while we're just waiting for some questions from the audience, just a reminder, you can submit those through the YouTube chat or the Zoom Q&A or through the form we sent out, link out that I sent out before. Um, we've already had a few questions come in, so we're gonna start with, with, with those. Um, obviously, you showed the example there of how the panda became the gibbon. So, how do you go through and test for those kind of examples to make sure your results are right? Obviously, we know that's not the right classification. So do you run basically a lot of examples and then just verify the, the sort of results? Well, validation is certainly a good point um, or is always necessary in every statistical method. But um, this is actually one of the, the reasons um, I'm, I'm so interested in these kind of adversarial effects um, because the way I think of it as a scientist, if this is real, in, if, if there's an actual causation in there, then this is not supposed to happen. If on the other side, I can take a correlation method um, and, and kind of throw it off base with something like this, uh, maybe it wasn't so good in the first place. And you probably saw uh, that the, it kind of kind of thought it was a panda, it was about 60%. So probably the confidence in something like this that it's that easily thrown off is not that, that, um, that high. The, these adversarial attacks are often, they're not plain noise, like this little sticker that was next to this. Uh, they're actually carefully designed and you can only do that if you actually understand what is happening in the neural network or whatever algorithm you use. Uh, if you understand this reasonably well, then you can do this. Okay, got you. And it's kind of linked to it. So it was, the question was sort of, so how do you actually make a good training set of data? <laughs> um, that is a very good question. I give, let me give you two answers to that. One. Okay, so one which is um, a little bit better um, grounded, and one which is my hope. So take that the second one with a big grain of salt. The first one is you need to cover the. Uh, you need to think a little bit, what is the feature space that you would like to cover? And then you need to make sure that you have a, a good coverage of each of these features in each dimension. So if you think back at the example of house prices, that was a bad bet because between the cheaper houses and the more expensive houses, there was a big gap. So clearly there was something that was missing there. Now imagine additional dimensions, um, you know, number of bedrooms, um, uh, maybe location. You want to have things that cover these, um, all these feature dimensions in a, in a reasonable sense. And then your predictions will only be valid within this these limits that you covered. The, the things that are outside of that feature space are probably a prediction that would be very good. All right, so that was the good answer, so real, if you will. The bad answer, or the, the one that is, says more about me than, than about machine learning, I suppose, is if we pick the right features, if you pick features that actually represent physics, the real world, of the, what is really the laws of physics that at the end of the day govern um, even complex systems, um, then by definition, you cannot be out of sample because the laws of physics, hopefully, are fairly general. And so a good data set, a good feature set would be one that really captures the underlying causation, if you will, whatever that might be, the laws of physics or what have you. Gotcha. So I think it's kind of in a similar way with data sets and it's coming back to topical and coronavirus. So obviously you've talked about sort of drug synthesis a little bit from that, but can we sort of use machine learning? This question actually comes from Evan on Zoom. Can we use machine learning technology to identify perhaps communities that are sort of high risk for aftershock, should we call them, if once 
countries around the world reopen. So can you use machine learning to try and identify sort of at risk kind of groups? Um, yes, and, and probably a lot of these things uh, have already been done, as I've mentioned, something like 4,000 articles or, or reports that were, so I didn't read all 4,000 of them. So, uh, but that is exactly what things are used for, when, to, to kind of identify these clusters of, uh, oh, you have to be very careful here, or here are risk factors. Um, and so this is something that is uh, actively ongoing. Same with um, trying to make clinical prognosis. You know, what patients is, is more likely to um, develop problems than others. But again, you run into this problem of causation versus correlation. And that is uh, in, in medicine in general, um, you probably have seen papers like where they correlate the probability of cancer with the length of your little toe or something. Um, uh, moon phase or whatever. Is that really um, a, a causation or is it just a spurious correlation? And that uh, is where a lot of work needs to be necessary. Right. Um, so one final question and looking a little bit ahead. So obviously, you know, artificial intelligence has come a long way in the last decade as computer power has sort of increased significantly. Um, how fast is our to in, sort of artificial intelligence actually advancing and where do you see us really being in five years from now? I have no idea because <laughs> it's, it's going exponentially and it's, um, it's uh, a lot about um, where the applications, I think the algorithms are pretty good at this point. Um, computing power of course goes out there um, continues to be exponential probably, where the big difference is, is can you get the right data sets? Again, it comes back to data, data, data. That is what powers the whole thing. And if you can access those, then um, uh, you can do almost anything. Um, I think the, uh, and again, this is quoting Andrew Nick, who has a, um, who's really one of the more uh, thoughtful people in the field saying, if there's something a human can do in a second or less, there's going to be an AI for it. Got you. Got you. So we'll, we'll, we'll get there, but we'll, we'll see if it's in five years or a little longer. Um, mm -hmm. one, final, one final question, which I think is a, a nice one looking ahead. So, you know, machine learning um, and computer aided synthesis is becoming more integrated in graduate education. Um, should computer science competency, given the growing field this is, be stressed more in kind of undergraduate and graduate education? Yes. That was a nice simple one. So, <laughs> excellent. That, that's one of the things we're trying to do in the center, um, try to come up with um, appropriate learning. Uh, what, what does the chemist really need? What are the things that, that um, that are needed there. And part of the problem is that organic chemists at least have a aversion against quantitative treatments of large data that uh, I've been preaching against for all the 25 years I've been at Notre Dame. Excellent. So t time for some changes in curriculum, maybe. So, well, yep. th thank you very much, Olaf, for tonight's talk. And yep. there will, the recording of tonight's talk will be available on YouTube um, either later this evening or uh, tomorrow morning. So if you've missed anything, want to go back and take another look, you can um, do so and you can look back at the previous talks from our University Review there as well. Um, we'll be back next Tuesday for on Tuesday the 5th of May at the same time of 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And that's going to be with Professor Alejandro Clocchiati, who's a visiting professor at Notre Dame from the Instituto de Astrophysica at the Pontifica Universitat Catholica de Chile. Um, he's going to be talking about the following. It's quite an exciting topic, being an astronomer that I am. Um, it's how the power of science really comes from its ability to make accurate predictions based on evidence. And the talk for that title is Flat Earthers Need Not Apply the Predictive Power of Physics. So that's what's coming up next week. And you can find all that information out on our website, nduniverse.org. Don't forget, if you're on YouTube, to subscribe to our channel there as well. 
Thanks again to Olaf for his presentation this evening. Thank you all very much for joining us. Stay safe out there and hopefully see you back next week online. Bye-bye for now. Bye.